All right, hello everyone. Welcome to my channel. Uh, my name is Thomas and I do educational videos and um, mostly things that are uh, not known by the general public uh, too well. Uh, just trying to get people, um, you know, aware of certain uh, theories and works of people that have spent their whole life on something and never really got any credit, never really uh, became famous or rich or anything, but they did it because they believed uh, that they were on the right track towards something important and uh, they made it their life's work. And uh, today is, I believe, the 125th video that we've done on the reciprocal system of theory. This is a theory that was arrived at by Dewey B. Larson back in the 20th century. He died back in 1990, and um, he put in about 60 years of work developing this theory, put out many, many books and many, many articles, gave a lot of talks, and uh, developed a, at least a small following before he died. Um, and uh, his, some of his, um, his colleagues have now died as well. And uh, this theory is pretty much unknown, but it is a powerful theory because it, uh, puts, um, it puts the ball in your court. It enables you to do science. If you understand the theory, you can create a theoretical universe in your head uh, uh, about how these various things work atoms work and photons and, you know, uh, astronomical phenomena, uh, all phenomena, you know, doesn't matter if you are a, uh, you know, you're interested in, uh, you know, in music, you can come up with the reciprocal, reciprocal um, theory of music and, uh, or you can, it doesn't matter. You can apply it to any subject. Um, and so we are looking at um, an interview that he did back in 1984. And he's actually about to talk on a little bit on this subject, uh, how he's uh, kind of taking his theory. Most of his early books were on physics and chemistry and astronomy. But how he wanted to take his theory into non-physical areas such as uh, psychology and religion. And he, um, he did that in his final book called Beyond Space and Time, which actually didn't come out till after he was dead, but he, uh, he had really put together the manuscript at least 10 years before the book was published. Um, this interview is from 1984, about six years before he died. Now, just to give you the basics of the reciprocal system, uh, Lars Larson's universe is a universe of motion, not a universe of matter and not a universe of energy, but a universe of motion. Matter and energy are merely just specific kinds of motion. Now, other people have come up with this before, uh, a universe of motion, but what distinguishes Larson is that he came up with the idea that uh, motion is the relationship between space and time. And space and time are connected by a reciprocal relationship, um, kind of like an inversion, uh, like a fraction. Three halves is the reciprocal of two thirds. Multiply them together, you get one but they have the same qu same general qualities, um, even though that they are uh, inverted. One is the inversion of the other. And uh, so the qualities that they have, space we know to be multidimensional, three or more dimensions. Therefore, time has three or more dimensions. This is a big departure from a uh, normal, um, you know, reckoning of time. Uh, and so Larson has to build that into his theory uh, also, time we know to be progressing, flowing. It's always getting later and later. And therefore, too, space is also progressing and flowing, always getting farther and farther apart. Uh, and the Hubble telescope detected that in the motion of the distant galaxies. They're all moving away from each other. 
and then uh, time and space both come in discrete units. Um, they're quantized. They come in only chunks, not continuous. And there is a smallest unit of space and a smallest unit of time. And one unit of space in one unit of time is the speed of light. And so the speed of light is really like the background uh, or even really like the ether of this universe of motion. And so half of the universe is moving faster than the speed of light, uh, which is a big departure from like Einstein, who says that the speed of light is the maximum speed of the universe. Larson says that the speed of light is more like the midpoint of the universe or the neutral point of the universe. And there's half that's moving faster, half that's moving slower. This enables him to get into um, a lot of metaphysical phenomena eventually. Uh, we covered that in his final book, Beyond Space and Time. We went over that book just before this, uh, I think for about 90 videos. And so you might want to check those out if... Um, you know, that's what you want to learn about. But we're going to take over uh, for this interview here. He's being questioned by a guy named Jan Sommer. And Jan uh, is going to ask uh, about how he's going to be able to get into the metaphysical areas. Into So the question is, how far were you able to go into these non-physical areas? Larson, my point there is that we're opening up an approach that wasn't there before. As matters stand now, the scientific view is that everything is contained within the reference system and that everything that exists exists in space and in time. Now, if that's true, there is no merit in the claims of philosophy and religion. The people, philosophers particularly, who adhere to that point of view, tell us that such things as ethics are nonsense. They have no basis in reality because there is nothing that they can be tied to. Well, that has been rather a sore point for a long time because most scientists feel that they have an intuitive understanding that there are such things and that they can't justify that intuitive understanding scientifically. Now, my point is that by eliminating this restriction, uh, since I say that space and time are the contents of the universe instead of the setting or container of the universe, that means that there is no particular reason why there can't be other contents. So that revolutionizes the whole approach to the thing. That doesn't necessarily mean at that point that there are other contents but it leaves the door open for producing evidence that there is such a thing, and it's not barred by the present scientific understanding. Question, how far do you think science will be able to go in exploring that metaphysical region? Is there any limit? Larson, I can't really say. I opened certain doors in the book that you have read, not particularly following any of them very far. For instance, the question as to the receipt of information. In science, you are dealing with information that comes in by way of the senses, physical information, as I call it. And present scientific opinion does not recognize such things as I was just talking about, an intuitive understanding. Intuition has no standing in science. Now, I have gone far enough into these open doors that I have been talking about to establish the reality of these intuitive processes as being just as real as the processes by which we get information through the senses. The problem with both of the cases is the verification. We can't believe everything we see or hear, and we can't believe everything that we think we know intuitively. And of course, as I've just tried to show, as I tried to show and I believe partially succeeded, is that a good many of these other things that we are dealing with, such as religious revelation and the ESP and whatnot, are merely forms of the same thing that we're dealing with when we talk about intuition. And naturally, as I said in the book, our scientific insights are no different in essence if we follow the scientific conclusions to their natural ends. We are only machines. The biological aspect is no different from the physical aspect. 
Physically, we're just a computer in an odd sort of frame. And that computer, that physical entity, can't get anything that isn't put into it. So if we're, getting, if we're going to get something like a new insight into some physical problem, whether it's science or economics or sociology or anything else or religion, we've got to get that insight in some other way than physical. And I think that reasoning along that line that is identically the same reasoning you use when arriving at a physical conclusion, you've arrived at the conclusion that there is a reality to this intuitive method of arriving at information. In one of the chapters, I show the things parallel in the diagram. We have the information coming in one respect through the senses and in the other through these intuitive channels. And we have to process them in much the same way. The problem, I think, with our non-physical information is that in most cases, it comes in in such a way that it is not processed in the way that we do the physical information. Somebody tells you that he saw a flying saucer, you are kind of skeptical on that, and you ask for verification. If you go to church and the minister lays down a principle that he says has come from on high, you don't question that. You take that on authority. Well, I think what we need to do to get on a better plane of understanding is to realize that the information that comes in that way is no more authentic than the hearsay that we get elsewhere. It might be right and it might be wrong. We need to subject all of it to a reasoning process to verify it. Question, but you mentioned somewhere in that book that we are very imperfect receptors of that information. So if the physical universe has no beginning, and if there are so many populated planets, Larson, I didn't say it didn't have any beginning. Question, well, you said that it's possible that it didn't have a beginning. Larson, what I said was that time was created if a creation took place at the same time as the rest of the universe, so that there wasn't a beginning because a beginning implies that there was a time before that when it didn't exist. Question. Of course, there's always a temptation to project time and space geometrically into infinity, and it's hard to get rid of that misconception. Larson. Well, it's misconceptions like these that have put us on the wrong track. Those are the basic things we have to correct in order to get the right idea. Question. Well, what I actually wanted to ask is if there are civilizations that are far in advance of ours, they would be more capable of receiving that information. Larson, I would think so. It seems to me that we can argue from the development that has already taken place, particularly in our physical ability to understand and in our ability to understand non-physical items such as ethical considerations, for instance. I don't think there's any question that what the situation at, that, at the moment from an ethical standpoint is far in advance than what it was 10,000 years ago. Question. Maybe 10,000 years ago, but I'm not so sure that there has been much ethical advance in this century or even over the last 2,000 years. Larson, I think there has. I think the mere fact that you question the ethical standing at the present time is an indication that there has been a big advance. I mentioned that point in the book that there have been periods during modern times when it has seemed that we have reverted to savagery. But we have to remember that 10,000 years ago, people were savages at all times. So that if we merely show little signs of getting better now, that's an improvement. We have to look at it over a long period of time. I don't think there's any question that we backslid in many respects recently. But that's another thing that I discussed in the book too, that that 
is a necessary step that we have to pass through. What we are looking forward to is a time when just looking at it from the ethical standpoint now and not saying that that's the basis of all progress we're trying to make, but just looking at that, we have to recognize that what we're looking forward to is a time when individuals will act ethically, right? Question. Yes. Larson. All right, now then, I want to attach to that something else of their own accord. Question. Oh, I see what you're getting at. Larson. We started 2,000 years ago with a situation where that relatively low percentage of the people that did act ethically did so under a certain amount of compulsion. They were offered the carrot and the stick. That has been one of the primary purposes for religion for thousands of years, and that has continued until relatively recently. Now, at some point, we have to release these people from their carrot and stick and get them to do these things of their own accord. I think we're in the process of going through that now. That's why we're questioning religion to a large extent. Well, I think that during this interim period when the people haven't come up to the level individually, we've got, uh, we will, we've, it says we've got C. Uh, we are seeing a kind of backsliding from a moral and ethical standpoint. It's inevitable. That's part of the price of progress. Question. Well, it's nice to hear that you think that the main direction is in the direction of progress and not the other way around. Larson, we've moved up to a point where in order to get any further, we've got to cut loose and let the people go by themselves. Even if immediately there's a drop here, then we'll resume the upward trend. Question. I'm glad you're such an optimist. Larson, well, that's not true optimism. That's a deduction from the facts that are before me. A true optimist, I think, would probably say that we could get along without this temporary drop. But I am not that optimistic. I think it will be quite a while before the standards of the people at large come up to the point at which the religious authorities had them when they lost control. Question, we seem to be like the optimist who claims that this is the best of all possible worlds and the pessimist who agrees. Larson, that's a point. That reminds me of Bertrand Russell's explanation of the difficulty in producing any scientific basis for ethics. It's been tried so often, but you can never get from the fact that it's a desirable thing to the point that you should act that way. As Russell said, the best world for the individual would be the one in which everybody else was honest and he was a crook. Question, you mentioned somewhere in your book that ethics is something that is peculiar to humans. But aren't there other things peculiar to humans, such as appreciation of music, literature, and art? Larson, I also mentioned that may be one of the things in which we have to improve, but that I've talked about ethics considerably because the facts in connection with that are somewhat available. I mentioned that there may be a necessity that we improve in aesthetic ideas or appreciation in the same manner that we need to improve in ethics. But I have nothing to go on, or I just haven't looked into that. It may be just as important. I don't know. Maybe more important. We still haven't come to a conclusion as to the overall objective. Question. You conclude with the universe being centered on the human being or the ethical being, whether it is human or in some other location of the universe, that the purpose of the universe is the creation of these ethical beings. Larson, I'm merely taking the facts as I find them and arriving at the conclusion as to what is being accomplished. And then I'm making the assumption that if it has any purpose, the purpose is what is being accomplished. Question, in the sense that human beings are the most complex of the organisms? Larson, 
Well, I don't think that's nece that necessarily enters into the picture. As I see it, there is nothing physical accomplished. It's just going around and around. Question, I see it's a cycle. Therefore, any structure that's created in one sector is eventually destroyed before it can go over into the inverse sector. Larson, I see nothing being accomplished there. The only one-way process I see that is, uh, I see is that bringing in unformed individuals, so to speak, and turning out some which presumably are at an advanced stage on the basis of whatever scale is set up for us. That's the only one-way process I see. And therefore, I conclude that there must be the purpose if there is a purpose, I have concluded that intuition has a basis and I intuitively feel that we have a purpose. And the great majority of people agree with me. And that again, I have set up as a criterion that anything that the great majority of the human race feel intuitively is probably right. Question. Of course, this book might be the one you'll be known for, though you probably want to be known first for all your work in physics. Larson, it depends on how you're using the term first. If you mean mainly, I'd say no. If you mean chronologically, I'd say yes. I'd like to get the physical books known first, but as far as the main event, I think even the economic works are more important than the physical. Question, really? After all, what good would it do to understand the physical universe better? It does some good, yes, but not immediately, and not probably deeply. What good does it do to understand the economic world better? Well, the effect can be immediate. It could cause an immediate and very drastic change of importance to millions of people. So in that respect, it is a more important work than the scientific part. Of course, in Beyond Space and Time, actually, my contention is that our economic affairs and our scientific affairs are incidental. Okay, we'll leave it there. We'll take over uh, tomorrow with the uh, continuation of this interview. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.